Good afternoon and welcome to the Lightning Talks this afternoon. My name is Matthew Gross. Uh, I'm with Alfresco University um, here. So anybody been, not been to a Lightning Talk? Nope. Okay. I'm going to go over this real quick then. So we're going to have five presenters this afternoon. Uh, each talk is five and a half minutes. Uh, each slide is 15 seconds and they're going to advance automatically. Um, any questions, please save those for the end, very end of the session. We should have a minute and a half or two to uh, go over those. So we'll bring the first presenter up here. Hi, I'm um, C.J. Joseph. I'm one of the solution engineers working for Alfresco. Um, thanks for, uh, to John Newton. He said the context for this talk this morning. I'll, in, this, uh, in this presentation, I'll, I'll show you how to make your ADF application listen to you. So voice and speech in ADF application. So you might have, what we have right now is the G um, GUIs. That's one of the user interface. I'm going to show you how can, you can implement the voice to it by Probably the last one, VUI, is the voice user interface. I'm going to use the web speech API that's been out there for a while, but still in rough state. That's the JavaScript API that enables developers to incorporate the voice data into their web pages. So ADF is one. It has two parts, uh, speech to text and text to speech. So I'm going to do speech to text today. And about the status and uh, browser support, it's, uh, it's been out there, but still rough. But Chrome, Edge, Firefox, all have implemented it. And uh, I've tested it, works great. And there's a mobile client too. I think it's the Samsung one that implements it. If you want to, like, diving deep, uh, before diving deep into it, if you want to test it, Google have, uh, they've got a testing page you can test in 100 plus languages. So I've used it, works. So that's, that's why I decided to try it out uh, with ADF. Um, so now they have the API. How do I get integrated with um, ADF? So it's a project called Anyang. That's a JavaScript library, really lightweight, 2KB. No dependencies, free to use, 4,000 plus stars on GitHub. So that's, that's the one that's doing this magic for me. And how do you integrate it with the ADF application? Really simple. Um, add that library to the index.html, create an Angular service, speech service, and use it whatever components you want to use. I'll show um, how you can do that in an ADF uh, form component today. And the rest of the slides are going to be code. So, so um, sorry for the small font. So this is index.html. You can see line number 13, anyangmin.js. That's the JavaScript that gets embedded into it. And once you have that, you have the library as part of the ADF application. The next step is creating a speech service. So you declare the anyang at the beginning, and then you initialize it, add a callback um, to listen to, uh, to the user speech. and and then push it, it to the like the components that are subscribed that have subscribed to it using the observable pattern for that. And at the very end, I have a bunch of functions to help me with my component development to start listening, stop listening, change of language, um, and also check whether it's supported by the browser. If not, I can do things like hide and do things, all that sort of things. Um, yeah, so that, that's. And there's like 100 plus languages. So I've tested this in a couple of languages that I know, like English and another language, so it works. Um, and in this demo, I'll show if it's not supported, I'll hide it, hide it and it'll, it'll fall back to the normal thing, uh, the normal typing. So this is the form that I did in the process services. On the right-hand side, uh, the form is rendered in the ADF using the ADF component. On the top, I have um, a hand list to disable, enable, and the selection of the languages. So the form template of the form that I just showed you is very simple. On the top line, I'm checking whether the browser supports it. At the very end, you can see that that's the ADF component. And in the middle, left couple of uh, material design components to, like, for drop-down and on toggle that interacts with the services that I have in the speech service. And if it's not supported, not show it, and changing the language, like pass it back to Anyang, those sort of things. So the form component, like so now this is the Angular TypeScript component, the class itself. The first page, it's three pages. So the first page is simple. It's a list of languages that I've implemented in my sample uh, application and the yeah, and a bunch of variables at the beginning and the form template URL style URL. The next page I do a bit but, uh, the constructor, I'm injecting the speech service into it. And uh, I'm I'm listening, I'm subscribing to a few things on form loaded event that's an ADF component on a form, and there's another subscription on form events. So when user focusing on, I'll I'll select that value and keep that in a variable, and then when when the user speaks to it, I just update that form field. So that's how I'm doing this thing. Um, so I can speak to it 
click on the tab and go to the next tab, and then uh, I can cat, like enter what all I spoke on there. And on initialization, yeah, um, so the top bit is, they are all the standard Yaman generator thing. The only thing that's relevant to um, the speech component on the very bottom, I have a I have a function there to change the language. So if I select another language, it will be uh, communicated back to the service in NEI and enabling and disable if the user doesn't want to use that. So that's, that's pretty much the form component itself. And I have all the source code available in the GitHub repository. This format won't let me demo it, but I can demo it on my computer if you want to, if you meet me after this talk, or I have a YouTube video less than a minute um, duration available on YouTube, and it's linked to the, on the project on GitHub. Uh, I do have a screenshot in the next page. This is how it looks like. These are the languages I use and tried it. It works, so it's not that good on mobile, but it works great on Chrome. So that's, that's me. Good afternoon, everybody awake? All right, after lunch, that's always a very important question to ask. <clears throat> All right, so my name is Nathan McMahon. I'm Alfresco's Senior Director of Strategic Services, and I'm here today to give us a really brief overview of natural language processing uh, and enterprise search, uh, specifically some opportunities for using the, uh, the functionality of NLP to improve our, our search experience. So, what is NLP, right? It's really the subset of artificial intelligence, which as John mentioned earlier today, is a huge field uh, that's concerned with, with helping computers understand us. NLP is how we get from that sentence to the breakdown that you see on the previous slide. Um, why do we need it? Well, you know, human language is, is really messy. It's ambiguous, uh, it's syntactically different. We say the same things in different ways, and that's not stuff that computers cope with well. So NLP gives us the tools to take our messy language and turn it into something that, that machines understand. Um, what does it have to do with search? A couple broad areas, right? We can use it for natural language queries, so better ways to ask for what we're looking for. Um, and we can also use it to develop a contextual understanding of content, both of which really should get us a better search experience. Um, what it means here for us is, is really syntax versus semantics. Um, NLP deals with both. Semantics, you know, the meaning of words, syntax, the actual structures. So how we say it and what we mean when we say it. Some concepts, uh, syntactical concepts, NLP deals with parsing, it deals with part of speech tagging, uh, sentence and word boundaries, and, and stemming and lemmatization. So the difference between running and run, or words like run, like jog, right? You know, we want to be able to understand those things. Um, semantic concepts, so named entity recognition. What are the people, places, products that are in our text? Uh, what are the relationships between them? How do we segment and recognize topics? Um, and how do we do sentiment analysis, which are all kind of the, some of the key features uh, that we'll discuss here. So deeper, uh, named entity recognition, you know, simple keyword search doesn't understand context. And when we search for China, we might be talking about China the country or China the stuff we put on our table, or Alfresco the company versus dining outside. NLP can help us understand the difference in the context of our text. Uh, somewhat related, we can also do salient scoring with NLP. Um, so that's how important a named entity or term is to the text. It's more than just reference counting, right? The most frequently counted term in text may not be the one that a document is actually about. Another common use case is sentiment analysis. You see this a lot in support case management and such, right? Does the text reflect a positive or negative sentiment? Um, some engines can score that down to the individual entity we're talking about. So was this person or place mentioned in a positive or negative light? Uh, and finally, document classification. So, the structure and topics, entities, relationships um, can help us automatically classify a document. It's much deeper than classifying by MIME type, but in our context, we could use MIME type as an initial filter. Um, so I decided to do a little integration experiment with this and asked a few questions, right? What's the right place to perform NLP on content stored in the repo? Uh, what do we need to analyze? Uh, should we do NLP before we ingest or perhaps part of the indexing process? Uh, I didn't want to make any major changes to my Alfresco instance during this testing, so really settled on a pretty simple pipeline, right? Document comes in, we use Alfresco's text extraction to pull the text out, we pass it to an NLP tool, and then we use the stuff that that NLP tool extracts to uh, create additional metadata to decorate our documents. Um, during this little experiment, I actually explored a bunch of different providers, both in the cloud and some open source options. Um, as it says there, the more text you have to analyze, the better it gets. So clearly, in, in terms of this stuff, cloud has a clear advantage. Um, if we're gonna go with cloud providers, you know, all the usual advantages apply, right? It's, it's pay as you go, they generally iterate faster, 
Um, obvious choice if you're already in the cloud. Um, On-prem has some advantages too though, you know, custom models and, and language support that you might not be able to get from cloud tools. The first one I looked at was Apache OpenNLP. Um, you know, some pros and cons here. It is open source, liberal license. Uh, if you're using Stanbol, this can be a really uh, great way to get started. Um, but it's not as active as some of the op other open source communities, and it takes a lot of work. Um, Stanford has a terrific set of tools. Um, also open source, not quite as, as liberal a license. Easy to get running for a POC. Uh, a little bit of an odd uh, web API, though, so uh, <laughs> be prepared for that. Um, Cloud NLP from Google uh, was actually one of the best that I tested in terms of results, right? It's mature, it's easy to use. Um, salient scoring for named entities is already there, uh, but of course you do have platform lock and you can't currently use custom models. The lack of custom models is also a factor with, uh, with Amazon Comprehend, right? So, you know, you can do one with SageMaker, but that's not built into Comprehend. It's using more of a generalized model. Um, it integrates well with other services, and my understanding is that their corpus is massive. Um, when we start talking about domain-specific stuff, that custom model capability be may become important for you. Uh, and that's really restricted right now to the on-prem options. You know, if you have a specific domain that you're wanting to train on, then a custom model may be a requirement. Uh, a few final thoughts. So NLP is not a magic bullet for search, right? Uh, it's, it's one tool among many. It can be very resource intensive, and if applied properly, it is capable of giving you a much better search experience. Go into it knowing what you want out of it. So, hi, this is Mario. I'm a consultant at a company called Pronexus. And um, yeah, the next few minutes, let's talk about SAP. So that will be not that deep technical as we heard it before, but let's try. So first about, about my company. So we are based in Germany, in the south of Munich. Um, we are with Alfresco since 2008. We are partner of them. We are also partner of SAP. And in total, we have more than 20 years of experience in ECM and uh, yeah, SAP. So our main focus is of the integration between SAP and Alfresco, which means we try to connect the um, structured data with the living content in Alfresco. And by the way, we have also been the first Alfresco partner ever that received the title Alfresco Certified Technology with one of our products. So we know, or you can make sure, we're matching all coding standards and even using public API. Yeah, while Pronexas is our company name, don't get confused, Conexas is the name of our product line and our product lines, and these product lines consists of, for example, Conexas for content, which is our popular Alfresco SAP integration that is on market a couple of years already. It's certified by Alfresco, it's certified by SAP. And technically, it's a Java-based application. Next one is Conexas for Fury, which is an uh, SAP integration for Alfresco Process Services. It's also a certified application by SAP, and it runs on the SAP Cloud Platform. Technically, it's HTML5. And the last one is Conexas for Process. This is a solution we offer to customers who integrate SAP data into Alfresco Process Services or Alfresco Activity, however you know that. Okay, a bit more technical in the first application connects us for content. So this is the setup. We have Alfresco on the one hand side, SAP on the other hand side. We are running in the context of Alfresco and there are different ways to exchange data and documents between those systems. One of them is the OData protocol, but we can also use HTTP pure HTTPS by get and put methods, for example. And there is also the possibility to exchange metadata via RFC, so TCP IP protocol. Um, all of these are using different parts in SAP, but all these different parts in SAP are available for each SAP system. Yes, and for customers on customer side, you can also adapt to our product by using our integrated lightweight framework. It's called Framexas. There you can adopt and yeah, um, replicate your own metadata. The next one 
is connects us for Fury, though that's the setup. Here we're running completely within the SAP Cloud Platform. We grab data from the iFresco process services by the public REST API and prepare it in the cloud and present it to SAP Fury. SAP Fury is an SAP um, user interface that was made for responsiveness. So, yeah, if you ever deal with activity uh, in responsive mode, you might feel the pain. But that's solved by SAP Fury. So no matter if you're running on tablet or on a mobile phone, it's responsive design. And of course, because we are running on the SAP HANA cloud platform, we can also exchange data with any connected SAP system. And for example, even for ex CMI, via CMIS with the Fresco system. So last one, last product in line is our Connexus for process. This is the other way around. Here we integrate SAP data in your existing Alfresco activity workflows. So the setup is we are running here on Alfresco process services side. The data transfer between um, Connexus for process and the SAP systems can be done either by RFC or OData. And yes, we are connected to the workflow and then you can, for example, have your um, SAP data ready in any drop-down box or even in a service task so that you can drive your workflows by SAP data, for example. So what we have done, we have extended the enterprise API. We do have a couple of custom form stencils available for that already and even some predefined SAP calls. And yeah, five minutes are nearly done. If you need more information, check our website. And for our um, popular SAP integration, we do also offer a trial version. So thank you. Uh, good afternoon, my name is David Ciamberlano and uh, my talk today is the, about small hidden feature in Alfresco. Okay, Alfresco hides many small less no feature that maybe you will never need to use but might prove to be useful in more than one occasion. So you probably didn't, want, didn't know that. In Alfresco, there are a few properties that you cannot be changed uh, for a good reason. The creator, the creation date, the modifier, uh, modification date, okay, and, and others. Uh, these properties belong to the auditable aspect. Uh, and in an ideal world, uh, would, we wouldn't need to change them. But we don't live in an ideal world, so <laughs> it happens. Uh, uh, behavior uh, prevents uh, this. Uh, uh, this metadata from being changed. Uh, all we need is to disable this behavior uh, before the update and then re-enable it uh, soon after. So, uh, the, with the policy behavior filter, we, we make a disabled behavior. Uh, after that, uh, we can set the properties with the, uh, updated properties and note the, the enable behavior uh, soon after in the final block. Uh, you probably didn't know that. Uh, to rely on the UID to retrieve a document from an external application, it's not a best practice, but it happens often. Uh, there's a way to preserve, to preserve the original UID when you import, when, during a migration, when you import uh, an ACP. Um, all you need is to uh, create a new action, extending the out of the box uh, imported action, the imported execute, action executor and overwrite, uh, obviously, execute implementation method, in which uh, we can find uh, the important part, the import view call. Uh, in the import view call, uh, we uh, need to use the proper uh, important binding uh, um, properties. Uh, if you need to, to see the code, it's on gist. Uh, for example, I can unzip uh, an ACP, and in XML descriptor, I can change the UID of a node uh, in this way. 
uh, when I import after the import of ACP, uh, I will find a node in Alfresco with the modified uh, UID. Uh, not the, the residual column on the, on the right, what's that? Uh, probably you didn't know that. Uh, in Alfresco, properties may exist that no, do not belong to any registered model. Uh, they are called uh, residual properties and are useful, uh, for example, to handle the case uh, in which uh, we, the uh, properties are removed from a type or from an aspect. Uh, in this example, I removed the property from a node. The properties continue to exist uh, in this node, but is mark marked as a residual. Uh, you probably didn't know that. Uh, you can uh, create also a residual property programmatically, uh, as if, if it were um, any other properties, but please don't do that because if you don't have a, a really good uh, reason. Also, you can control the indexing of a content in Alfresco uh, applying the in index control uh, aspect to a node. Uh, this aspect exposes two properties. Uh, index uh, content is content indexed, and uh, mm, the properties, uh, the combination of the properties of the, the two um, determine whether or not the metadata and the content are indexed in a fresco of the, the specific node. Uh, you probably didn't know that. Uh, the hidden aspect allows you to uh, hide a node from a, a service or a, a client, share or web dev, uh, many others. Um, uh, this aspect uh, has uh, five properties, um, client visibility in the flag, uh, with which we can uh, modify its behavior. Um, finally, you probably didn't know that. It's possible to export the whole content of an Alfresco site with one command, uh, one web script, uh, the export uh, web script. Uh, you can also uh, use a curl. Uh, note that uh, this command export uh, the content, uh, the people, users, and group uh, all together in, uh, in uh, one zip. Uh, you probably didn't know that. <laughs> to check quickly if a custom model has been correctly installed in uh, uh, Alfresco, you can use, uh, again, a web script. Uh, in reality, it's a, a web script family, uh, the dictionary web script. Uh, we can, uh, okay, <laughs> thank you. Hi to everyone. For those who don't know me, my name is Sergey Paluch and I am owner of Flex Solution Company. I am delighted to be here today to talk to you how our company has implemented the extension for Fresco that allows filling Microsoft Office templates by using already available in our Fresco tools. Our main goal was to simplify creation of typical documents inside the company. We wanted to make it as simple as possible for users, so we add new option to the create menu on document library page in share interface. We add new options there for each document type that is inherited from our basic flex after generate type. And the display label of that appears in the menu. We show the form and click on this option. And after filling this form, the system generates a document based on template and uh, metadata values. Uh, as for templates, we have chosen office formats, such as Doc, uh, DocX, and ODT, as they already support uh, formatting of the text, as well as uh, embedded objects, like uh, images, tables, and so on. So that, to work with office formats, we have used OpenOffice, since it's already integrated with Alfresco, and uh, we do not need to take care about any connection issues. Uh, moreover, there is a Java Uno library that provides a way to call OpenOffice methods needed. One more thing. As you all are aware, Alfresco already supports FTL. Uh, oh, sorry, I forgot to explain about uh, properties. To map 
objects inside the template uh, to node properties, we decided to use short name of these properties, but we were required to replace a colon to an underscore. As you all know, Alfresco supports FTA. And um, that's why integration of powerful tool into uh, Office templates provides a lot of benefits. Uh, for example, you can use cycles, you can use formatting, and so on. The main issue that we had to solve in this case was a way to find uh, FTL, FTL code inside our Office template. To do that, we just wrap um, code that should be processed by FreeMarker processor into the code tags. Briefly, we look for the position of the opening tag and for the position of the closing one. Uh, then we get the text between these positions and push it to FreeMarker processor. After that, uh, we replace FTL block as a result of processing. Uh, right now, let's expand on technical aspects and uh, to make this implementation possible, we need to inject uh, Office connection and FreeMarker processor bins into our Java service. Um, by default, uh, you can't inject Office connection bin into your service because it's created in subsystems context. However, you can solve it by using subsystem proxy factory bin as shown on the screen. FreeMarker processor bin can be used without any problems. Um, you can just inject it, so I believe we do not need to pay a lot of attention to this step. Regarding Java Uno library, it allows, yeah, it allows us to call the, the necessary methods of open office, for example, to search for the position of the text or to replace the text. Less than 20 lines of the code are required to replace some text in the office template. The main points are the following ones. Uh, you need to get X component loader from Open Office connection. You need to send content of template to Open Office. You need to replace uh, the text, and you need to save result to a node. Uh, to execute our service, we generate documents by template automatically. We wrote an Alfresco behavior that is executed on update properties of our type and all the subtypes. We developed our type just to mark types that are required automatical content generation. Uh, firstly, we wanted to use aspect for these needs, but uh, Alfresco model manager does not support specifying mandatory aspects, so it does not work for our business requirements. Please take a look at this screen. It shows um, how our solution works in general, what we do step by step. Um, I believe it's not interesting for users, but it should be interesting for developers. The negative points of our solution. You must validate FTL blocks before processing. Uh, also, you have to provide additional efforts if you want to use uh, embedded objects inside your FTL blocks. And the styles of uh, processed text are copied from the first chapter of the FTL block. Benefits. Easy way to set up new template. No additional libraries required. All power of open office is under your control. Different formats can be used and uh, FTL syntax can be used inside your template. Thank you all for attention. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask me.